Hey, somebody needs to plant the garden. You have? Excellent. Good morning, afternoon, or evening. You are listening to The Professional Noticer. Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Andrews. Hey, thank you for making me a part of your week. My purpose here today and with every show we do is to play the part of a best friend or a coach. I want to help you live the life of your wildest dreams by giving you access to the greatest mentors the world has to offer today. This week, the professional noticer is sponsored by Books for Veterans. The Veterans Administration in Washington, D.C. has asked for 10,000 Andy Andrews books. And I'm personally donating as many as I can, but to reach 10,000, I need your help. What we're able to do to make that easier for you is for every $12 donation you make, a hardback book will be sent to the Veterans Administration for veterans, their families, and for employees of the VA. That $12 will cover the cost of the book, the shipping and handling, or you could purchase one of these awesome Books for Veterans t-shirts, and your purchase will include a book sent in your name. So whether you can make this a personal gift or a corporate donation, just go to andyandrews.com slash veterans. This can be added to a website purchase done as an individual entry or in conjunction with a Books for Veterans t-shirt. Thanks very much for your support. Observations and answers, that's what we do here on The Professional Noticer. And as you know, we love it when somebody comes to the table with both. And we have that today. We have a longtime friend of mine, and I'm not often in awe of my friends, you know? But I gotta tell you, this friend, I I am a little bit in awe of. He is, uh, he has done some things that make my jaw drop. He is a New York Times bestselling author, and uh, his book, Team of Vipers, was an instant New York Times bestseller. His book that he has coming out now May 7th is called The Darkness Has Not Overcome. And uh, somebody wrote, uh, one endorsement for this book says, Cliff Sims has written the book America Has Been Waiting For. It's a nonfiction book that reads like a thriller. And in the genre of faith and politics, it may be the best book ever written. Actually, I said that. I I wrote that, but uh, I totally believe it. Please welcome Cliff Sims. Hey, Cliff, how are you? Yeah, I'm great, man. Thank you for having me. Man, I, I've just got to tell you, I've been... You know, you and I have talked a bunch of times as you were writing this book and then going through the acquisition process, <clears throat> and and I read a bit of the first that you wrote maybe three years ago. Was it three, two, two yeah. years ago? Mm-hmm. Three and, years ago, four years ago. Yeah. And uh, and I I know I told you several times you have got to do this. I've never read anything like this, and. It's kind of a devotion book. It's kind of a a, a thinking book. It's I I don't know how to describe this book, but I just knew you had to do it. And so you sent me one when it finally came in that it comes out May 7th. And I've got to tell you, this book is as good as I thought it might be. Well, thank you, Andy. And you, your encouragement throughout the process was very instrumental and in even, um, you know, giving me what I needed kind of inside of me to to finish the process, because as you know, better than I ever would, uh, you know, writing a book is a is a journey of self-exploration in a lot of ways. And, uh, it, and it ain't easy. Um, but this one in particular, you know, the idea was I've got all these stories from the White House when I was working there, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, all these cool behind the scenes stories like, you know, you want to know what it's like inside the nuclear bunker. Uh, You know, you want to know what's in the president's nuclear football. You want to know what it's like in the West Wing or in the CIA, all these kind of behind the scenes stories. But what I really wanted to do after I left was, first of all, uh, I wanted to understand what that time period of my life meant for me and see if there were like lessons that I could take away from that time period that I could apply to the rest of my life. 
but also in realizing at this particular moment in American politics that are so divisive, it's a very tough time, I think, right now in American culture, especially for uh, people of faith. You've noticed wanted- that. Huh? Oh, You've noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. It seems to be just a little bit. And I wanted to see if there were lessons that I could take out of that that would apply to anybody's life. And so there was, you know, figuring out if that concept would work was the first challenge. And then the second challenge, and you and I talked a lot about this, was finding a publisher who would believe in what I was trying to do because the mainstream publishers, like my first publisher that I had, uh, didn't want anything to do with faith, didn't want anything to do with the Christian angle of it. And then the faith-based publishers, the Christian publishers, were scared to death of the politics. And even that process, I think, is kind of a commentary on what's going on in the world right now, that people are living in fear. Um, and and that's not a biblical worldview. Uh, and so finally found a publisher that believed in it um, and was able to get the book out. It's coming out May 7th, like you said. And uh, I'm very excited to see what everybody's reaction is to it. You know, before we... Before we go into the book, I want to back up just a little bit. I want to give people a little a little background. The, uh, the book's title is The Darkness Has Not Overcome. The subtitle is Lessons on Faith and Politics from Inside the Halls of Power. Now, I told you when I introduced Cliff that I'm not often intimidated by my friends. And it's not really Cliff that I am intimidated by, it is some of the situations in which he has found himself that have dropped my jaw. I mean, you know, he he went from um, from founding a, 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 a news company, Yellowhammer News, and doing radio and doing print media and interviewing a couple of people to being asked to do some strategic things for the the Trump campaign. And then after that, he was so influential that he was asked to join the, the the staff. And I never will forget the day that you called me, Cliff, and said, hey, I just got in my office and my office has one office in between me and the Oval Office. And you sent me a picture of right outside with that portico where they pull the limo in. Right. And I was like, oh my gosh. And then and then there are times that I would call you and I'd say, okay, so, so what are you doing today? And you say, well, right now I'm going through security, but um, I'll meet with the president. We'll go through uh, what he's going to say at such and such a thing. Then we're going to go do the, uh, at somebody's funeral. I, I think that day you were going to, um, to a Billy Graham thing. Oh, and, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, it just, but, but I mean, uh, Cliff is a guy who has had conversations with Jeff Bezos, with, uh, with Elon Musk, uh, with Robert Kraft. He has had conversations with everybody you see on the news. And then you wrote the book. You wrote Team of Vipers. And you had spent 500 days there in that job, and you felt it was time to leave. And and you wrote the book, and uh, Trump was not happy with you, was he? <laughs> Initially, he was not happy with me. That's right. Yeah, and I I think I thought it was interesting that that uh, his children told him, "Dad, read the book." He doesn't say anything you know, bad about you specifically. He's just talking about the people. It was, it was a team of vipers that that came together to run that White House. Nobody could trust anybody. And and uh, and so, but at some point, he got over it. And then you came back as Deputy Director of National Intelligence, which that's second in command of what, 13 intelligence agencies? Yeah, it's eight, 18 of them now. Uh, 18. So, yeah. And and I was like, oh, my gosh. So anyway, this is the perspective from which this book has been written. Here's a guy 
who is a is a husband, a daddy, uh, a very strong Christian, who has who has walked in in the the largest halls of power in the world, and so I am so excited that I, I mean to to see that you start these little things with with like uh, standing on the seal in the CIA building, watching on television when Joe Biden was being uh, inaugurated, and you knew that was your last day there, and and the verses that, that you called on to help you at that time. I mean, the whole book has stories like that and, and explains things that we've heard of, but you just never knew that was how it really happened. And so I'm just, I'm just, I, I know I'm babbling, but I'm blown away by this book, Cliff. And I, I've got so many people, I already told you, I'm buying 20 of them because I, I wrote names down today. I, I'm going to make sure Dave Ramsey's going to get this book. Jim Trestle's going to get this book. There's a lot of people that I'm going to make sure get this book. And, and, um, uh, so how happy are you that it's done? I mean, you're in a in a place now that it's done, and now you're getting ready to launch it. Yeah, I'm I'm relieved in some ways, but you know the writing process is cathartic, and and uh, you know I love I love writing. Um, the promotional aspects of it, I'm not sure I'm, I enjoy as much. I mean, having a conversation with you is fun because we're friends, uh, but you know, going on on you know all these shows and. Uh, you know, you never know what you're going to get. So sometimes that's well, when not- you when you went on uh, on you went on Colbert with yeah. uh, with Team of Vipers, and I thought that was an interesting insight. And this is in the book. I, I that was an interesting insight to him. I've never particularly, you know, I, I don't watch him, and I've never particularly been a fan. But I got a different view of him when you said that before you went out in front of the audience, he stopped you and said, and knowing what your topic was going to be, he said, hey, if if any of this audience boos you or heckles you, I will stop things and tell them that is not how we treat our guests. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciated that and, and gained a lot of respect for, for Cole Bear. And I will say um, he is an anomaly in a lot of ways uh, in that regard, because there are stories that I tell in, in this book about, and in my first book, about the the fact that, you know, this will come as no surprise to people, but, but political television especially is really closer to WWE than people would really imagine. <laughs> Everybody comes on, you've got a pre-planned set of talking points. Uh, they want to see your talking points in advance because they're thinking about, okay, I'm going to pit this person against that person. We're going to, you know, it's it's all kind of orchestrated. You have a role that you're going to play, you know, the heel or the hero or whatever it may be. Uh, and a lot of them are just the phoniest people that you will ever meet in your life and so disingenuous. Um, and I'm kind of jaded to it now, but, uh, you know, I, I tell a story in the book about, for instance, um, on CNN, uh, getting ready to go on Jake Tapper, um, a friend of mine, Dave Bossy, who was a deputy campaign manager on the first Trump campaign prior to them coming on air. Jake is asking Dave about his family and, oh, how's everything going, Dave? And, oh, man, I hope you guys are doing great. Family looks great. Man, that's so good to hear. So good to, you know, whatever. He's just having this very earnest conversation about his family. And the second that they come on air, he flips a switch and tries to jam Dave up about, you know, how could you let your daughter be in the same room as a guy like Donald Trump? It's like, well, you were just talking about his daughter off air. Uh, in, in the most complimentary ways possible and how great of a dad Dave is and all these different nice things. And then you come on and now you're going to play your role. You're not going to, you're not going to be sincere. You're playing a role. And so, uh, yeah, at, on the, the late show uh, with Stephen Colbert, you know, I really don't like talking to hosts prior to going on the air Right. Because of what happened to Dave, they try to soften you up and it and it gets you out of your mindset to like, hey, I'm about to kind of go into battle here. I need to be kind of geared up for that. 
Um, and so I'm back in my dressing room there. Uh, and the first thing is they have somebody come in and they, uh, hey, Stephen would like an, a signed copy of your book. So, I, you know, sign the sign the book for him. I'm thinking in my mind, oh, here we go. Um, and then right before I go out there in the commercial break, I'm standing backstage, just about to come out onto to the stage. And I watched Stephen get up from the desk and come over there behind the the kind of screen there. And he shakes my hand and he said, really, you know, really appreciate you coming on. This is the first time we ever talked. And yeah, he said, I just want you to know that if anybody in my audience boos you or heckles you or or treats you unfairly, we will stop the show. And they don't, they tape, it's live to tape is what it's called. Right, so sure. you didn't know if it's live, but it's pre-recorded. He said, we'll stop it. We will cut that out. And if we have to, we'll tell them to leave. We're not going to let them treat our guests that way. And so now my head's spinning because I'm like, wait, is Stephen Colbert like a good guy? Like what's going on back here? Um, and, you know, we had a kind of interview that you would expect. It's not that he's going to go soft on me when I go out there. He's asked me tough questions. He's going to tell his jokes and he's getting, but you know, it, it, he was a decent person. And I think one of my takeaways from that was that is actually closer to my experience with real life, with real Americans, people that I'm friends with, people who are my family, who don't like Trump, honestly, who are not Trump fans but they think I'm a good guy and we have a difference of opinion on a political issue or whatever it may be, but they don't think that I'm evil. I don't think they're a bad person because they've landed in a different place than I have on political issues. That's closer to reality than the WWE political television that we consume so much of. And so right. you know, one of the things I'm doing different with this book rollout, I'm doing very few of those type interviews. I would much rather have a long form, nuanced conversation on a podcast than I would to go on a three minute television seg uh, segment and get my teeth kicked in and get in an argument with these idiots on CNN. I, I just it's it's not enjoyable. And I don't think the audience benefits and it doesn't sell books. So I'm not. Doing I'm, it. I must say that I I think the longest time I ever held my breath in my life was watching you on The View. <laughs> you and me both, man. I mean, I was like, oh, oh, oh. but you, you, man, you did Anderson Cooper, you did uh, Jimmy Kimmel, uh, tons of these shows, and so I, I, I held my breath when I when I watched you, but I thought you did great because I, I know, I, I mean, tell tell me, and and I think people would be interested in this. How many times did you uh, and you say you actually say in the darkness has not overcome? You talk about how uh, Trump said that he used to write a letter. He would write a letter and then he would leave it on his desk and come back and look at it and change some things. And he said, but he told you that in this world of Twitter, he said, now I I do something and. Then, you know, an hour later, things are blowing up and people are hating me and screwing. So what conversations did you ever have with him going, hey, you know, your life would be easier if you just wouldn't say some of this stuff? <laughs> well, you know, I, I think people would be very surprised um, at... Uh, the level of of self reflection and self awareness that the president has a, about himself, and you know, the conversation you're referencing right now was an interview that he did with uh, Barstool Sports with Dave Portnoy, and Dave Portnoy asked him a very similar question: like, have you ever thought, you know, you fire off a tweet and you're like, after the fact, you're like, Damn, maybe I shouldn't have, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done that one. And and the president said, oh, too many times, too many times to count, you know, and um, and yeah, it's 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 this uh, expectation now with social media in which a few things that have a few things that have happened that I think are destructive. One is everyone now has a platform, whether you're the president or whether you're a random person with, you know, 43 Twitter followers out there in you know some rural Iowa. The second thing is, it is uh, an expectation now that everyone must take a stand on every issue. 
It used to be that in the office at the water cooler or, you know, around the dinner table, certain topics, it weren't, it, it wasn't that you just absolutely couldn't talk about them, but in polite society, there was like certain things that were just like, you know what, we're going to agree to disagree on that. We're not going to hash it out over here, you know, whatever. But now think about back during the, the Black Lives Matter movement, for instance, if you did not put a black square on your Instagram to signal to the world your position on that that issue, you were going to be attacked for it. So you see you'd get attacked because you said something, you chose to put yourself out there. Now it's you get attacked if you don't use this platform that you've been given to virtue signal to the world of what you believe about something. And uh, it's become, uh, it, it's created really perverse incentives for everybody out there, up to the president of the United States at times, who uh, will maybe not be as thoughtful as he otherwise would be, because he's like, I'm going to get right out there and I'm going to say this right here in the moment, rather than having a little time to reflect on it and being a little bit more thoughtful about it. And even President Trump uh, conceded that there were times where he wished that he would have done that. And I think that that's a lesson for for all of us. I think I've got a question that I think you are uniquely designed or positioned to answer. Um, and and if you look at politics now and this election is heating up and we've got two people who, you know, they're people are passionate one way or the other about both of these guys. And so how do you separate the person from the policy? Yeah, no, it's a great question that has existed as long as democratic politics have existed, that you're, you know, going to cast a vote for a, a flawed human being. And that's just, you know, the world that we live in. But I think the story that I would tell that illustrates the way that I look at that uh, is actually from The View. When I was backstage at The View after my interview, uh, which, you know, went about like you would expect it to, you know, it was a, right. it, it was a circus. It was a little bit of a circus. And Joy Behar, who's probably the most aggressively anti-bunch of the, of the group, pulls me off to the side. And my wife was there and she actually complimented me and expressed her appreciation for my willingness to come on the show at all. Uh, and then she said, she did have one question for me. She said, what's a nice guy like you doing working for somebody like Donald Trump? And I kind of laughed it off and told her that I probably wasn't as nice as she, as she thought I was. But I also said that my personal experience, you know, working with Trump had been pretty positive. And she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what I mean? And the more I've thought about that question, I do actually understand what she's getting at, not just with Trump, but for plenty of people that I know and love. The real question is, how can you disagree with the things that a person does, but still support them or even hate some of their actions, but still love them? And the answer is actually simple when you really think about it. It's easy. That's what I've been doing with myself for my entire life. I mean, if you think about um, what Paul wrote in Romans 7, I do not understand my own actions. I don't do what I want to do, but I do everything that I hate. I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil that I do not want is what I keep on doing. And so in, in spite of the countless number of times and the ways that I've messed up, I still love myself. I still give myself another chance. The amount of grace that I've extended to myself without a second thought is only surpassed by the amount of uh, grace that uh, an all-knowing God has shown me. And yet I rarely extend that grace to others, especially with those of, with whom I disagree. And so I think that that, you know, being able to give that grace to other people uh, is something that will totally you know shift your paradigm. People ask me all the time about Trump. Um, how I feel, you know, writing a book uh, now about, you know, faith lessons and, uh, you know, what do you think about the, the you know, name a thing that Trump has done that you disagreed with that was maybe an, uh, against the Christian faith or, or, or not in keeping with the, with biblical, uh, a biblical worldview. And I'll say, look, is Donald Trump the greatest picture of the Christian faith? No, he would concede that. But from a policy perspective, has he defended the Christian faith and the principles that we care about? 
from from the the pro life issue to instructing the Department of Justice to no longer uh, go after the nonprofit status uh, of uh, faith based organizations to defending the 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 conscience of Christians in the in, who serve in the U.S. government to not go go along with certain uh, rules in the government that violate their Christian faith and no longer you know persecuting them in that way. Uh, I could go down the list of policies that he put in place that are um, uh, defend my my conscience, my sincerely held beliefs as a as a Christian. That the Biden administration uh, is is an affront to uh, every single day. So that's the way. Uh, it's kind of a long winded explanation, but like that is the way that I view that issue. That's interesting, and you you discuss that in this book. And I, and I want to make the point that this is not a book about Donald Trump. Um, yeah. There there are stories in it uh, about. Donald Trump, but this is a book about the halls of power and the the lessons that you learned and the biblical worldview that came to your mind at certain points and the the verses that meant a lot to you. Um, I just, you know, every page of this book, it is it just it it's riveting that's that's the word that's the word it's riveting i i could not take my eyes off of you know the first time i sat down and started reading um i read the stuff that i had read 3 years ago when you were figuring out what you wanted to do with this and I was like, yes, 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 yes. And so then as I got past that and and realized just the the, the little moments, like like I know in in uh, one of the chapters, you're in a in a room with some aides before uh, the big guys come in and they're talking about how much is that bird worth? You know, how much is that? You know, because there's some redecoration that has gone on and there's an eagle statue and and you laughed because they thought it was metal and you knew it was actually wood. And yeah. I, I, just these little behind the scenes moments and and the the times when there's huge crisis and the times when it's just walking with the president and he's had something happen that was good or he said something that happened that was bad tell me tell me about the day when when you and he were about to do a press conference and you and he were in a room by yourself and there were all these screens in the in the room and it was from all over the world, news feeds all over the world with people rioting and having death to America and hanging mm -hmm. Trump in effigy and burning the flag. And it yeah. was on all these screens. It, do you remember that? Tell me tell me about that. Yeah. So you're referencing when the president decided to move the U.S. Embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Now, this was a promise that presidents going back to my goodness I, maybe like reagan i mean we're talking decades worth of presidents when they would campaign promise to do this and then once they get in the office they wouldn't do it because they would have you know aid after aid would come in and tell them oh you're going to set the middle east on fire if you do this they're going to you know totally freak out over it and so trump made this promise on the campaign trail and get in there and i, I figure a lot of people thought He's probably doing the same thing. He's saying what you're supposed to say, and then he's going to get in there and he's going to renege on that negotiation just like everybody else did. But he, we get in there and he actually says, we're going to, we're going to do it. And everybody's like, wait a second. You know, he's like, yeah, we're going to do it. I said, was going to do it. Why would we not do it? Okay. So he does it and he announces it. And um, we, right after the announcement, 
uh, we're standing in, our, in the room that you're referencing called the Outer Oval. So it's the room right outside the Oval Office where his assistants sit. And there are a couple of screens in the room. And every TV in the White House uh, is actually cut in four. So it, it has four screens on one screen. So you got MSNBC, CNN, Fox, and Fox Business on every screen in the White House. And so you can immediately see what's the coverage what are the little chirons at the bottom of the screen saying about whatever he's done? And so we're standing there and we're watching it. And boy, oh boy, I mean, it, it does look like, you know, the protest all over, um, you know, Israel, all over the Middle East, uh, you know, people burning him in effigy, people burning the American flag, stomping on the American flag, chanting death to America, all these different things. And I, I remember the feeling that I had uh, which I would compare to the feeling when you see someone trip on the sidewalk and you actually kind of look away because you don't want them to see that you saw them and be embarrassed by it. Like this secondhand embarrassment kind of feeling because I'm, I'm watching, you know, the most vitriolic hatred that you could possibly direct at a human being being directed at the person that I'm sitting right next to, uh, you know, and so I've, I, I felt kind of weird uh, about it. But Trump's reaction to that was, you know, he kind of watched it quietly, kind of took it in, took it in. And they look at me and he looked at me and said, um, all right, what's next? Like, what's next on our schedule today? And we went on with the rest of the day as if nothing was going on. Uh, and and I will never forget that because I hate criticism. I can't. It, it really bothers me. Uh, not just unreasonable criticism, not just people like attacking me. For, oh, he's a crazy conservative. Oh, he's, you know, whatever. But but criticism that questions my motives, that questions my morality, that questions who I am as a person, or someone who I know doesn't understand my intentions behind something and they're assigning nefarious intent to something that I've done. My Every impulse inside of me is to like want to grab them by the lapel and like, no, listen to me. I promise I'm trying to do the right thing. You know, whatever, explain myself. And it and that is an impediment, I think, to a lot of people doing great things because they don't want to receive that criticism or have their intentions called into question. Politicians are the worst about this. Most of them put their finger in their mouth, hold it up in the air and see which way the wind's blowing. And that's which way they they go. Trump is not scared to be eviscerated. Look what they have done to his life. Look the way that they have attacked this man and his family. And he's being drugged through all these criminal trials that are just nonsense. And he, I have never seen him discouraged or never seen him allow that to dissuade him from doing the thing that he believes is the right thing to do. And, um, you know, you said it, this book is not about Trump. It's not, I'm not even here to try to convince people to vote for Trump or whatever, although I, I am and I, I support him. But that was a true window into what political courage, what moral courage looks like in the real world. And most politicians wouldn't have had the guts. We saw decades of it not being willing to move the, the uh, embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. But in the wake of that kind of criticism would have started walking it back. And he didn't. And then what was the result of that? Unprecedented wave of peace agreements breaking out across the Middle East. Not chaos that we're seeing today, not mayhem, not war, but people said, okay, now we know where that guy stands. And so now we know what the kind of rules of the road are. And let's let's do a deal. Let's start cutting deals and let's bring some uh, stability and peace to a region that's been devoid of it for so long. So that was a, a an experience I'll never forget with the president. Wow, Cliff, what <coughs> what is your wife's favorite part of this book? Oh man, great question. Um, I I would I would say probably uh, the parts where I talk about um, us adopting my son. Um, we adopted a little boy uh, three years ago from Colombia. Uh, he's six years old now. Um, and, you know, there was a, a journey that led up to that for us uh, personally. My wife uh, struggled with, with infertility um, and is a journey that, you know, it's one of those things that uh, until you go through it, until you get older, 
it's one of those things people don't talk about it and you actually don't realize how common it is either for people to struggle with infertility or uh to have a miscarriage and and different things like like this and now we've met so many people and people that we're friends with and we've walked through that and and understanding um the grief and uncertainty that goes uh it's a part of that and and as we first started thinking about adopting um you know, one of the great things about this journey is I get to be honest about it now in a way that I think other people aren't because I want people to be uh, encouraged and not afraid in the ways that I was about it. There's this lingering doubt that a lot of potential adoptive parents have in the back of their mind. Am I going to love this child the way that I would love a biological child? And you don't want to say that out loud because that sounds like a very, what a terrible thing to say. But people who are being honest with themselves who have considered this, it is a it is a rational question. Yeah, to and ask. you're asking yourself, am I a terrible person? Right, yes, 100%, 100%. Now, on the back end of it, I can say definitively, absolutely, let me give you encouragement that there is, you will absolutely love that child with every fiber of your being because I've experienced and walked that journey myself. But my wife, when I was in the White House, um, he went on a mission trip with our church and I wasn't able to go because of, of my job. But she went to Africa and part of that trip was to work in an orphanage in Africa and see those children and love on those children and, and want to leave with one of those children so bad that you can't, you want to take them home with you. And, and um, that experience changed her heart. And when she came back, she was like, I'm ready to it. Like, let's go through the adoption process. Uh, but there's a scene in the book from, uh, you know, I'm in the West Wing there in uh, Sarah Sanders, now the governor of Arkansas, uh, who was the press uh, press secretary for the president then, where I got emotional, like talking about this and talking about our journey. And I kind of walked through that story of, you know, our adoption journey as a part of this book. Um, and it's been the most rewarding experience of of our life. And people in a very misguided but well-intentioned way often say, oh, it's amazing what you did for that child. No, no, no. It's amazing what having that child has done for us. Uh, our family wouldn't be complete without him in our family. And so it's been an amazing journey. And being able to write you know, about it in this book, um, I think, is something that I hope will encourage a lot of other people to get out in faith and and consider adoption as well. Well, buddy, thank you for being with us. I I have to say this is this is one of the most spiritually pertinent books that I have ever had the privilege of reading. And and I cannot <clears throat> to to our audience, however small it may be, I cannot encourage you enough to go ahead and pre-order not just one of these books, but pre-order three, four, or five of them. Because I'm telling you, this is one that when you when you are through, uh, you're, you're through 40 or 50 pages, you're going to be wanting to have your hands on another book because you'll be thinking of somebody that you need to get this book to, that this will mean so much to them, um, that it it explains the title, that the darkness has not overcome us. Christ is still on his throne. God is still in charge. And I, I really, I can't tell you how proud I am of you and for you, Cliff. I know this took a lot to get it written, to get it published, and now to have it out. And And so anything that I can do, anything I can ever do, you know that, but anything I can, I can do uh, to move this book, to promote this book, and to promote you and your family, I'm in. Well, thank you. And just being on here is an honor. And I really, really appreciate it sincerely. You know, I I do hope that um, I I want I want people to to buy this book for several reasons. One is um, I do think it is uh, timely for this moment in American politics where we do feel so beaten down. And frankly, Christians are facing persecution in our country socially in ways that they never have before. This book speaks directly to that. 
Um, but also, honestly, my experience with struggling to find a publisher willing to do to publish this book, we have got to support um, we, artistic publishers. It, we, yeah, we've got to support people who are willing to step out on our behalf. That's right, because they have a profit motive, and I'm totally fine with that. That's totally fine. I have no no problem with that. We've got to show that things like this can be successful in the marketplace so that we can have more of it. Uh, and that's something that I really hope will be the result of this, because frankly, if I'm being completely honest, the publisher to this day, um, publisher hasn't booked a single interview for me to do on this book. I've done it all myself. The publisher has shown no desire to get in big behind it and, and make it a big thing. And I've and I have told them until I'm blue in the face, I'm telling you the audience for a book like this, this kind of content, there is a hunger for it out there. Uh, right oh, now. Absolutely. And so we're, we're about to show the whole publishing industry that that's the case. Oh, I agree. And let me say this so people can say that I said it. There is a hunger for a book like this. And so come on, come on. We've got to get behind this book, Cliff, and show the publisher. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, buddy. Thank you. To the man. I'm Andy Andrews, the professional noticer, harnessing common sense and wisdom to plow through challenges all the way to an answer for you. And I think that'll do it for this week. Get us out of here, Matthew. So, ladies and gentlemen, and to the boys and girls who aspire to become ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of another episode of The Professional Noticer. In a world where common sense has become a superpower, I'm harnessing that tiny bit of mental energy I have for you. Seeking wisdom, making observations, and endeavoring to answer tough questions in a way that will empower your family and your business. I'm Andy Andrews. Until next week, goodbye. This episode of The Professional Noticer was produced by Matt Limpert. The Noticer theme written and performed by Sugarcane Jane. Snapper hooks for the cast and crew provided by Twinkle and Smoke of Beverly Hills. Additional financial consideration provided by FakeBusinessCards.com. Friends, do you remember when a fake ID seemed cool? Yep, yeah, right up until the moment you were shamed or arrested. Well, now, there's an adult version of that juvenile trick that isn't illegal and might just gain you that immediate respect you so greatly desire. FakeBusinessCards.com is a repository of small pieces of paper to which we add your name and voila, the fawning adulation from others will become apparent. Log on now to FakeBusinessCards.com and you'll quickly see there is no reason to get a law degree all you need is a business card that says you're a lawyer. When someone remarks that a project is failing because no one involved is a rocket scientist, you can say, I am, and show them your card that proves it. Want to date a particular woman who loves animals? Show her your card, Mr. Zoologist. Now's the time to be all you can be. FakeBusinessCards.com